I really have to pick all these up. Jeez, look at how long these are. These are all from 1994. So, from December to uh, from January to December. All right, let's get through these. Let's briefly mention these. Okay, so come on, let's go. Conundrum by Steve Lyons. This is from January. Secrets of Mind Robber. Also, it's the fourth of the Aussie History Cycle. Uh, pretty good, that is. You know, like, people think it's a very fun one, enjoyable, for a first effort. Again, like, same with Left, left Hand hum, Hummingbird. You know, for, for, for a first time, it's uh, brilliant, that is, you know. People seem to love this one, even though it's, you know, in the same vein as Time of Exodus, they're great, you know, you know, sequel, sequel stories to classic Doctor Who stories are actually quite interesting. Some aren't the best, but some, it just depends how, with, with your imagination very much. So Conundrum is one of them, which is quite good. Moving on, No Future, this is came out in February, so I never mentioned Paul Canal before, he's actually one of those um, perfect writers, people know him who actually wrote from the um, Father's Day and the, you know, the two-parter, Who Wins Your Family of Blood. Um, he's written quite a few novels in the, for Virgin, of course, this is his third novel, this is. He wrote Time of Revelation and then Love and War, this is his next one. Uh, this is sort of like his weaker novel very much, because um, apparently he mentioned, he mentions like he'll it's sort of like he'll overindulge everything. I can understand why, but it's a really interesting novel because it's set in the punk era. It's in, it's in nineteen seventy six, but it's, it's in that late hit period when the punk when punk rock started to rear its head in Britain. So it's worth, you know, I always wanted Dot to really enter this sort of idea, and this novel, I think, gets my interest very much. I think it's very. There's a lot of re it's called No Future, so there's references to Sex Pistols. You have also, if you look at the artworks, you have other stuff like No Free Instant Submission as well on the walls. Brandy Summerfield joining a punk band. Interesting. Uh, the characters, because the character itself, what's the guitarist called Danny Payne? He actually re reappears as well later down the line as well. Well, you know, for a very particular good reason why. But it's, it's interesting. It's the fifth. And final part of the Auto History Cycle. Uh, interesting, apparently, Mortimer, Jim Mortimer wrote Blood Heat, and Steve Lance wrote Conundrum and Russell Paul actually had the interesting idea of actually creating this. You know, there was it was sort of their idea to being in with while in a basement in a basement, actually, believe it or not. And they had Jim Mortimer wanted, you know, to use have like to change the Doctor's TARDIS to make it a bit more, you know, like an alternative uh, version of the third Doctor's TARDIS, which some doctor uses. Actually, for, throughout, actually, from Blood Heat until the 50th novel, actually, they still kept. But it's basically their idea, and Daniel Blythe and Kale and some of their stories as well to be part of it. But this is like one of those, this sort of uh, comes together, of course. Return, it's actually the meddling monk who actually is responsible for the, the, the alternative causes very much in time. Um, we have, we have the recurring villains, of course, of the Vardens from Adventure of Time. Who remembers them? The ones made out of tinfoil. Really? And the Chronovore from the Time Monster as well as in this as well. Really? Hmm. It, puts you, it makes you think about that, doesn't it? It makes you think it does. I mean, because Paul Cornell, uh, Cornell actually mentioned in, in, you know, in panels and everything like that, you know. When talking about the Virgin Adventures, he always mentioned, like, you know, no war. No, uh, no, no future. I said no war. Why no war? I mean, love. I, mean, I keep thinking of love and war for some reason. No future. This is all the weakest because he put all. He said he put the entire kitchen sink in. He does because I do like the idea because it's a unit story as well. Even though the big idea is very say a bit unsure, a bit unsure, a bit same. He is like he's not very he's not himself really. It's sort of the same thing in Bloody as well, which is an alternative version of the big idea. He's more calm, and bitter, and aims to basically. Goes to all the Salarians. In this one, he seems to be, he seems to be brainwashed and doesn't trust the Doctor very much. You've also had the return of, of course, um, Sergeant Benton, of course. You know, because it's in it's in seventy six, so it's basically, you know, as always, you expect the you know the longest, um I think basically after when the fourth Doctor left, very much at the end of Robot, and you know, where do we where do we go from there? Maybe something like that, really. But it's, I do like the idea. I do like the idea of it being in the centre of doing the, the punk movement. I think it works perfectly. And interesting. So that's No Future. So I've talked about the uh, conundrum of No Future. February, no, January and February. Then we go to March. 
Tragedy Today by Gareth Roberts. Gareth Roberts wrote an old story before last year, Higher Science, that came out in February. Um, another, this one's one of his weaker novels. I don't really know much about this one in particular, even though it has like a bit of political elements as well. You know, conspiracy and stuff like that on the planet. I'm uh, still really not too sure about it. I think it, it actually, I think one of the main villains is actually a 40 year old boy called Crispin, I think, isn't it? <laughs> Weird enough. I think so, actually. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah, some 40 year old teenager called Crispin's one of the main villains in the story. Interesting, but that's all I can really know about Tragedy Day. So I can't really say nothing about it. But that's done by Gareth Roberts. Second novel, of course. And apparently, he mentioned in the Mythmakers for the Virgin Publishing, apparently on September 93, he just sent him, the, I think he sent him, you know, the submission for Tragedy Day the day before. Before this, you know, for the event. Interesting. So we're going to April now. Legacy by Gary Russell. Gary Russell, uh, a very another sort of like um, a well-known writer, of course, who basically works extensively, uh, extensively on Big Fish. We also did a few. Um, he mainly worked for the Virgin Misadventures of you know for obvious reasons. I'll get into this reason anyway. But also he contributed to um, the Beauty books as well. I think he, he actually still does now and again do like the occasional new adventures. You know the new series adventures very much, so that's how it is. So Legacy is his first published novel. It's a follow-up from the Peladon stories, Monster, uh, the Curse of Peladon, and the Monster of Peladon. Should be something like Legacy. I think it would be too obvious, really. You know, saying like le you know the Legacy, Legacy of Peladon, or something like that. But it's interesting, interesting because apparently in the book, it mentioned interviews, but also the little introduction as well. Something about this as well. He met Brian Hales, who actually printed the Ice Warriors, who actually written all the, you know, Ice Warriors season death and the Pelennon stories, of course, in 1976. And he basically think, why are you going to do any more Pelennon stories? And I don't really know, but he saw giving him some advice, you know, well, I don't know, because I have no, have no ideas. And apparently, at this time, you know, Tom Baker was, you know, Tom Baker was around as, as a doctor. Nothing really came from Hales afterwards, very much. So, he suggested to me, he, he told to Gary, he mentioned to Gary Russell, of course, you know, what, you know, the story, you can write out, you can write the story that you always want to, you can sell, you can sell Pelland on anything like that. And this is what you get. Although, when writing this, Gary Russell have, have been issues with it, of course. Two things, really. One thing, because the Doctor was down, Dark Media, of course, we're the seventh Doctor now. And then, obviously, the the idea of including, you know, sort of adult themes very much, you know, like maybe occasional sex scenes, of course, I think, because Ace and Betty do have sex scenes in this novel very much. I think Ben is a sex scene for Ice Warrior, well, well, believe it or not. Um, so that was something he really wasn't in, really into doing very much. I mean, some people weren't. You know, it's basically like you can treat it as a classic Doctor Two story, but you include the Seven Doctor in very much. and. That is, but I think they weren't. I think people were very unsure about it. I mean, another writer I really think it was like Christopher Bullis, who actually written one story, which was Shadow Mind, but afterwards he went on the misadventures. Same with Russell as well, because he went on to write about three star novels in that line as well. Um, of course, so some of them were, you know, these were people who actually grew up in the sixties who loved the the doctors, but also wanted to keep it in that same sort of camp. Rather than people just go flat out experimental, do something very outrageous as an adult and something you can never do on television. That's what I love about these novels. You can just go, you can just go, you can do different things with it. You know, you can look back if you want as a nostalgic point of view. You know, good. You know, instead of story in Peladon, do the story you always want to do. Add a little. If you if you're forced to add a bit of bits and pieces, that's totally fine. You know, it's part of the main contract very much. Over over than that, you can just go bonkers. Do a flat out horror story, do a lot of body horror, gore, have a lot of bad language in it, you know, sex violence. You can just plonk it in a story like that. You know, I can't imagine they can do it on television these days. You know, if they did something like this, you know, do a series like that and put it on television, chances are they'll probably, I don't know how they'll, how they'll do it. I think one thing is, you know, Mary Whitehouse is not around here anymore, so they can't, she can't go, you know, creep over the shoulder all the time, like they did back in the Philip Finchcliffe era. So, 
What else? I think that's about it, really. But I can see Russell's point in that you know he wants to do the, his own you know his own adventure, but also had to do had to tick a few boxes as well just to get it published to the to version standards very much. So that's about it, really. Um, it's it's it's, it's alright, not bad. Then we've got to May, Bit of War, Justin Richards. Justin Richards, a very prevalent Doctor Who writer, did stuff for Big Finish. He's also became the editor for BBC Books from 1999 to 2005. You know, and there's been a good few of novels. This is, only, again, his only Virgin New Adventure, very much. But I think he he actually did bring him off the Benny Sum when Benny Summerfield had taken over as the main character. Dragon's Wrath? Yeah, Dragon's Wrath, that was his, that was his one. But he also ran for the Virgin Mist Adventures as well. I think he ran two. Yeah, System Shock and Sands of Time. Um, it also introduces a new character called Levin Braxton, who's apparently a Time Lord from the Doctor's past, very much. He gets a reference again in a novel called Empire of Glass, Ryan Lane, of course, which actually featured the first Doctor, Stephen and Vicky, which apparently is set between the Time Meddler and Galaxy 4, believe it or not. Interesting, I can still remember all this sort of stuff, and you know, it always fascinates me, it does. So, and also, it was adapted for Big Finish, of course, along with like Nightshade and High Science and Love and War. So, it's probably worth it's probably worth checking this out as well. I mean, it's good, I mean, people say it's a good story, so I haven't read it yet, but I'll see what I think of it. Let me come on to June, All Could Soon Fire, basically, Dot Human is Sherlock Holmes, very much written by Andalane, who actually read. Co-written the story of Jim Ultimate called Lucifer Rising, which apparently is actually, you know, it's a eh, good novel it is. You know, you know, put two brains together and you can, you, know, you get like, like this little interest novel here. This is also quite good as well. I mean, compared to, there was something mentioned about, you know, with Mortimer and Lane very much. Like, Lane, Andy Lane wanted to, was focused on more character development, and Jim Mortimer was a big idea guy. Like, he had these big ideas and, you know, do what he wanted to really wanted to do. Lutheed is an interesting example for that. Even that's an old story that he'd written for a Doctor Who fanzine. He did. And obviously this fleshy out and just do, just do what he wanted to do with it. You know, make it a bit more... Because he was influenced by horror, I can stand by Mortimer, stand, uh, by Mortimer. I'm influenced by horror myself very much in a few certain things. I think it's worth it. With Andy Lane, I think, because he, he actually more... It was more relevant to... He was more familiar with Sherlock Holmes years and... It sort of works in this, because apparently, yeah, because he read a number of articles for Sherlock Holmes magazine, if you can see it there. Excuse the light. Yeah. Um, interesting enough. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I need to. I think it's it's more, it plays out more like a Sherlock Holmes novel in a way. They have a little decent artwork as well. It's pretty interesting. I mean, people think this is one a good novel, this is. Along with many of us. I mean, there's like, there's a good, decent selection amount. Of novels you think, and that's good, that's good, that's good, that's a bit, mm. and it's like, well, oh god, no, not that one. You know, you always get that sort of thing, you know, you know, you can start off with a very terrible novel, and afterwards you get a few decent gems. I mean, this is like, like this is another one that I mean, coming off from here, like from my four, because you have Conundrum, which is actually good, you know, you know, people always love that one. No Future is a bit weaker, but some people love that one. Tragedy Day, weaker, Legacy. Sort of mix that one is. Virtual of War, classic, Auction Fire classic. So, and these were these were both included in the sort of big Finnish ad adaptations they did. Um, obviously, which is which is interesting. I mean, give you, give you kudos. One thing to mention about this, um, we have a little nod to Basil Rathbone there. Also, Nicholas Briggs, who actually was the voice of the Daleks, who actually played the Doctor in the Order of Visual Range back in the late, mid eighties. He Plays Sherlock Holmes actually in the, in the adaptation he does, so it's interesting that is. Give it up. So that's all consuming fire. That's from June. And then we've got July. Blood Harvest by Terence Dix. Terence Dix, script editor. He was also was it from sixty eight to seventy four. He was the script editor. Was um, then also he ran over sixty novels, which are the target novelizations. He was very prolific in there, and obviously Time of Exodus in. August 91, he, that was published. And that was a sequel to The War Games, that was. This is a sequel to State of Decay from season 18. Um, interesting idea. Um, also, 
I'll speak about them later. This is actually is connected to another to another novel. Basically, the Missing Adventures, uh, for the very first Missing Adventures, um, got offered by Paul Connell, which I'll talk about. I do have it, so look out for that one. People will be gleefully pleased about that. So Blood Harvest, interesting because it's in Chicago. You've got Al Capone, uh, Romano is back, Gallifrey returns again. So it, in a way, it is very, very much heavily a sequ you know, very heavily sequel to State of K, very much. Um, that's actually the background itself. This actually comes from the Nostromo from Alien, believe it or not. Um, I thought I, who actually did the cover for this? Bill Donahue. He actually did that. Give him credit for that. It's actually a very impressive cover. That is. You know, interesting. So that's Blood Harvest. Um, again, a very, people say it's actually a very good sequel, um, a decent sequel. I mean, stuff like from, I mean, so, you know, say in 1929, then you've got the, the vampire plant in East Space, then you come to Gallifrey. It's interesting, it is. And also you have like this new, this character called Decker who's actually similar to, to Duggan in City of Death. You know, that sort of thing. You know, like he's he's brought on and you think, you know, he could be an interesting companion. Sadly, not really. Because apparently... That was like a. That was like a little conversation on the internet, on the internet forums and everything like that. You know, like what, you know, is Decker could be a companion or something like that. I don't know really. Um, so where are we at now? So we've got January, February, March, April, May, June, July. This is August. Strange England, Simon Messenger. Um, Simon Messenger, an interesting author this is, because apparently it says on here, he's a writer and performer of comedy who also works as a part-time English teacher. Believe it or not, so he's a basic, so he's basically like a, a teacher just writing a Doctor Who story. I think, you know, Strange Young is his first novel. Um, it's a bit weird. The cover itself is quite good. I'm trying to think, who did the cover for this one? Again, looking for the Paul Gamble. I'm actually reading it. Um, Very interesting. Um, so in the Victorian house, it's similar to um, mind you, there's a few, there's a, there's another book as well in this line in Knife as well that focuses on inside being inside a big house very much, like as the main setting. This is one of them, like saying the real Victorian house, it's something like 1873, I think it is, set in precisely. It's actually a TARDIS, it is, and it's basically again looking at other, other, other timelines or Gallifreyans that we sort of introduced because. We get introduced to a few people. I mean, we've got the monk from No Future in No Future, um, fit, Evan Baxter in Theatre of War, and then we've got Sophie of Gallifrey, Return of Roman, and Blood Harvest, and then we get and then we go to Strange England. So there's heavy, the soul bringing that sort of Gallifrey mysterious thing into the novels, of course, which they were trying to do. Um, Strange England's sort of a weaker novel in a way. I mean, it's only it's his only novel in the Virgin New Adventures. He didn't write any of the missing adventures. He did, he did. He did carry on for the BBC Eighth Doctor adventures, though. Uh, if you actually I remember, he did the Infinity Race. He did. So it's interesting. It is. I mean, the quack itself. I mean, that that alien itself. Look at that. That is impressive. That is. I mean, imagine seeing that on, t on television. That'll freak people out. I mean, the kids. You know, behind a silver type. I think that's really. You know, they'll haunt people's dreams. It's very steampunk as well. Claws. Two sets of eyes. Two sets of mouths. And it's creepy. So that's Strange England. So in September, September now, first volunteered by David A. McKinty. David A. McKinty written a story called White Dance Before Night uh, Free, which is. Uh, so is the, McKinty's novels um, in the Virgin New Adventures are basically like historicals, very much like pseudo -histo uh, historicals. Excuse me, guys. Pseudo historicals. Uh, so White Dance now set in. Nine, uh, 1915 in Haiti, actually, because apparently there was no other story. There was only two stories that were sort of set in, like, that were non European, which was Marco Polo and the Aztecs. And actually, that sort of. That sort of has a not, little bit of not seen Aztecs in my darkness, it does. This one focuses on the sort of um, American history, this does. Set in 1957 in New, in New Mexico, this does. Uh, during the. I'm really trying to think, actually. It doesn't really say. I forgot, but it's, it's doing like a missile testing ground very much in the late 50s. Very much. Doing a time like the early precursors to the Cold War and everything like that. Um, really good this is. I like the cover. That's done by Tony Mazzaro. I think it is. Mazzaro. 
He actually did a few other the Kula Tiger covers. Let me have a look. Let me check. Come on, come on, come on. Tony Mazzaro. Yes, it is. That's really good, that is. That is an uh, interesting bit of Ace. That's actually came from a photo shoot that Soul Theology did. Well, the face does, actually. This all, this all trace the face and do, do something different with it. That's what they've been doing with um, a lot of these novels, actually. You, you get some interesting re references they do. Um, so, say in the late 1950s, how nice in America. Um, is that sort of is that, movie, that B movie quality in the way? It does look it actually. Um, the main thing with this is the return of the master, who actually last appeared in Survival. And this is where he's ended up. He's actually he's used the aid of an alien race known as the Tazun to repair his dying body. He goes on, under the name Major Korea, Major Korea, or Korea, because apparently it's based on a character that Roger Dugdale played in the Avengers, and. Basically, to state the name, and of course, it's still Anthony Ainley as the master. I think more survival Anthony Ainley. And then afterwards, A shoots in the back, and then he regenerates into Lazar Rathbone. Uh, I mentioned before, he, he you know, he, it's basically a similar thing like Lazar Rathbone is Sherlock Holmes in the novel, in the novel of Consumed Fire, now he's the master in First Frontier. Uh, McKinty actually based on a few. Uh, film characters they have with watch over time. One being Tim for Dalton's portrayal in The Rocketeer. Uh, there was Julian Glover as well, apparently there was another influence. Uh, Ricardo Morbi? I really can't remember Ricardo something. And I really forgot the other day, but there's there many like four people I've sold became this whole main influence pretty much for the new version of The Master. Sadly, we don't get him anymore. We only get him in two novels. This one in First Frontier and the 50th novel Happy Endings, and that's it. You know, we don't get we don't get him anything else really. I don't know. I thought we would gain more. Like go, you, know, you know, sort of like a, a bit like um, like usually again classic series. You know, like a decent mass story. Maybe like maybe maybe twice a month. I don't know. I don't. Maybe twice a year. I don't know really. But it's quite a shame actually, because I think I think that master had sort of like a bit of potential very much. Mind you, I think people went sort of interested, they wanted to create their own stories and just do what they like very much. So that's okay. I guess at that point, but including the master, the only two stories I think it's a bit hmm, you know, they've included a lot more recurring characters as well, which I'll get on to. But first one is okay. And afterwards, um McKinty went on to Sanctuary, which is actually uh, a very disappearing story for very much so doing the French Crusade. Interesting. He also did Autumn Mist as well, the BBC after Eight Doctor Adventures. So that's first frontier, so that's September. Now we're going to October. Saint, Saint Anthony Spire, Margatis. Margatis wrote Nightshade in. Oh, um, no, hold on. August 92. Which apparently was the very first uh, novel to not include in the arc. It's it's basically the first standalone story for the Virgin New Adventures, and it's good. It is. This one's his weaker effort. I do have to admit. I do give him credit to try to do different things. Like it's like it's more against like being up against like organized religion and everything like that. But listen, the the Bush the Bushtarians, I think they could, I think they're the last or the or, or, yeah but, no Betrusher. Can't pronounce the name of the planet. Yeah, it's interesting. I do like the idea. Of course, um, a soul gets submerged into his religious cult and everything like that. Interesting, you know. And also, it's been a, it's been a threat to the people who live on the planet and when and this whole other planets, of course. So it's interesting. The Chapel of Saint Anthony's Fire. That's about it. So that's all I really know. All I know is it's his weaker it's it's his weaker novel. And by this point, actually, um, he was doing the League of Gentlemen. Or they were doing like live shows. They were in like. You know, there was a performance you can, you can watch in live in Jury Lane in 94, so this is around the time when he would have been doing League of Gentlemen with Rhea Shear Smith and Steve Pemberton and Jamie Dyson. So that's interesting. That's an, a bit of interesting little, uh, a little stamp point there for him, very much. So that's what I can say about Sense Ace Fire. Moving on, November. False Shadow and Daniel Armani. This is a very chunky novel this is. Huge, believe me. I mean, sort of like Loose for Rising, Warlock is another one, and Sylvia Sin as well. They all have that, you know, quite massive in this one. Uh, Daniel Manley, interesting one, because he, 
either love Dottie fan scenes, even though it says here like he's occasionally meant to be meant to be controversial. Controversial indeed. Um, this is actually, I don't know, it's like his version of Ghostlight, because apparently the story itself, because apparently he written this actually you know, based on rumours of Ghostlight, of what actually what it was. I think Ghostlight was meant to be, it's sort of, it was meant to be some, uh, basically a story called Lungborough, but elements were used, the house setting was used, uh, but basically, for obvious reasons very much, because um, they didn't explore the Doctor's past on television, you know, as yet, because he was more of a mysterious figure, but they didn't, they didn't want to discover his past a bit more, so, really. So this feels like, this feels a bit interesting, because he, um, in, you know, a bit interesting villain, of course, you have, uh, was it, I forgot the name now, was it Tanif, Gabriel Tanif, I think they're known as? I think so, Gabriel, Gabriel and Tanif on this one as well. So, I think it's more interesting to read it as well, I haven't read it yet, but probably get there eventually. So it's in, that's interesting, that's Falls of Shadow from November. And then finally, we come to December now, 94, Parasite, Gene Mortimer. This, so, compared to his other stories, of course, I do have another story of Gene Mortimer to bring up. Uh, his first one, obviously, he'd been list for Rising of Andy Lane. He also in Blood Heat as well, the first story of part of the Ultimate History Cycle. This is the second one, and apparently Mortimer was a bit was a bit unsure where to go with this one. He was also right at the time the novelizations for Cracker, Jimmy McGovern's Cracker, which he mentions here, Mad Woman the Attic. And apparently he enjoyed that better than writing this novel, although he tried to style it as a McGovern type story very much, like he was trying to do like a writing style. Of Jim McGovern very much. So there's a bit of like a cracker element in this book. Um, more in some of the influence. There's some weird influences with these novels, of course. Like there's always bringing stuff in. Uh, the Jim McGovern thing can be a bit irrelevant, but very much like, you know, there's like a bit of influence in maybe it's only in this novel, maybe, if you understand. Well, to put it straight, I think people were just including still, you know, Virgin had a lot of interesting properties they did. Um, speaking of which, uh, which I'll, which I'll, I can mention here right now. Um, so they did, I mentioned Jim McGovern, they did the novelizations for Cracker, only the first nine they did from 94 to 96, so from The Mad Woman in the Attic to White Girl, uh, no, uh, True true Romance, that's it. Um, some of the company did White Ghost as well, um, so they did, so they did the nine ones. Uh, there was the Judge Dread novels they did of 2000 AD. They did a couple of them back in 95. And Sonic the Hedgehog. Maybe four novels for Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, a TV show called Bugs. It was like a science fiction show called Bugs. Done by Brian Eastman. Um, something called Strikers. Like a, like some, maybe like a, a preteen football drama, drama, comedy drama type series. Uh, something called Sunset Island, which is like, say, Back safe from the bell, pretty much. Uh, but they had an interesting selection they did, and you can. It seems weird actually when you think of it. You know, I mean, they did some novelizations of TV shows as well. But Cracker, it's interesting because I know Morsmer did a few. He did Brotherly Love as well, Mad in the Attic. Gareth Roberts did uh, uh, to be a somebody. He did to be a somebody novelization. I think someone else. I have a hard time look at. You know, there was I know uh, there was someone called Maxwell Halliday or Max Halliday, she she quite does in the in the novel, and then Liz Brown. So that's interesting. So these are all from ninety four, from January to December ninety four, from Conundrum to Parasite. So that's basically a year. That's basically a year, very much.